Hello. Hello. I'm Karen. Hey, Karen. hey Antoine. Uh, I'm principal of Jenkins Johnson Gallery in San Francisco and New York. Thank you for joining us. My team and I hope that you're healthy, safe, and well during these very challenging times. We welcome you to our 14th Conversations on Culture, a weekly discussion during the COVID-19 pandemic with artists, curators, and collectors on current art world topics. Today, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with Antoine Sargent, one of the most important voices in the art world today. Before I introduce Antoine, I wanna take a moment to recognize the passing of civil rights icons, C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Robert Lewis. Yesterday's New York Times opinion section included an essay by Mr. Lewis written shortly before his death to be published upon the day of his funeral. I'll quote a few words from Mr. Lewis. Though I am gone, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and fear. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. So today, July 31st, 2020, part of the beginning of the 21st century, I began our conversations on culture with John Robert Lewis' final marching orders. Antoine Sargent is a writer and civic and critic living and working in New York City. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, New Yorker, New York Review of Books, W, Vogue, and other publications. He has contributed essays to museum and gallery publications on Ed Clark, Michelin Thomas, Arthur Jaffa, Deborah Roberts, and many more. Antoine has lectured and participated in public conversations with artists at the Studio Museum in Harlem, Brooklyn Museum, and Harvard and Yale Universities. He's also organized a number of exhibitions, including The Way We Live Now at Aperture, Then and Now, Chase Hall and Cameron Welch at Jenkins Johnson Projects, and the traveling exhibition Young, Gifted, and Black. He is shortlisted for the 2020 Krasna Krauss Book Awards for the new Black Vanguard Photography Between Art and Fashion. That makes it sound so official. <laughs> <laughs> you are official, my dear. There'll be a Q&A at the end of the conversation, so please send us questions via the Q&A button and also join in the chat during the conversation. All right, Antoine. Okay, Here's Karen, let's do it. Right. In the words of John Lewis, let's get into good trouble, right. necessary <laughs> trouble. <laughs> so, you know, just briefly, uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, your growing up in Chicago and going to college and how you came to become involved in the art world. Well, I mean, you know, that every time Wait, you think Just one second. While you're doing that, we're going to, um, just so the audience knows, we're going to just show a couple of images of, of some of your projects mm -hmm. so they, they'll hear your voice and you know what's going on. There you go. Okay, perfect. Um, well, you know, I've always, I grew up in Chicago and, you know, went, it's a city with great sort of cultural institutions, you know, um, Art Institute being one of them, 
um, and a great many, um, you know, museums like the Chicago Historical Society um, that I was able to be involved in and really sort of loved art from, you know, very young. Um, but I went to college and I studied politics at Georgetown um, and um, DC also is a great place. I uh, have a lot of great uh, free museums. Um, and after college, I moved to New York and I was a teacher. I did Teach for America um, and then stayed on for an additional two years um, teaching literacy. Um, and while I was doing that, um, the long sort of end of short of it is I met, you know, one of my best friends, Jaja Faye, uh, who at the time was working at the Guggenheim Museum. And she would basically bring me places, you know, take me to uh, parties and artist studios and invite me to Guggenheim stuff. And, um, and you know, I had this moment, you know, after seeing a Michelin Thomas show at the Brook Museum in 2012, um, where I was like, well, I want to know more about this. And the places I usually read aren't really sort of writing about, you know, these shows. And so um, I'm hanging out with a lot of artists. I can't really, I can't paint, I can't photograph, I can't kind of do any of those things, um, but I can write. And so that maybe that'd be my contribution, you know, to the circle. Um, and so it all started there, you know, um, trying to sort of get to know the artists that I was, you know, sort of hanging out with, that I was in their studios with. Um, from the standpoint of their work, you know? And so I did a lot of studio visits. Um, one which, um, one of the earliest ones was we shot in Newsom, who I know the gallery now rep, reps. Um, and it was just, it was just such a sort of uh, personally like freeing uh, experience to sort of write about artists and to sort of be in dialogue with artists and to sort of, um, uh, you know, share my thinking about the work um, with the world. And that was, you know, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and, you know, it, and every day it just kind of continues. There's a new project, there's a new um, artist to know, there's a new sort of um, dialogue that's happening, you know, culture changes. And so um, artist responses, you know, are always changing to sort of the social situations that we're in. And it's, it's really sort of exhilarating to not only write about that work, but also um, you know, sometimes curate that sh that work into exhibitions um, that sort of uh, operate in a different sort of way, right? I always say that, you know, the curating is sort of uh, writing with objects, right? And yeah. so that has also been sort of interesting. And then also now um, starting to sort of publish books have also been another way um, to sort of think critically um, about um, Black artistic practice. Um, yeah. but also expand my own practice into editing and, and all these other sort of fun things that happen when you um, produce books. So would you, would you say that you're really uh, involved with artists of your generation? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, one of the really sort of uh, important sort of points of entry was for me was, you know, hanging out with like Jordan Castile and AWOL and Eric Mack and sort of, you know, uh, Sable, you know, um, and Jennifer Packer and sort of all the, you know, Cameron Welsh, um, all these sort of young artists around who are my age and who sort of came up in New York around the same time as I had. Um, and to sort of, you know, they were all new, I was new, no one was really sort of paying attention to them yet. And I was like, I want to write about these artists. I think the work is important. I think that, you know, what my generation, um, is doing artistically um, matters and that that you know that you know who else um, should be writing about this other than someone that's inside the circle someone that's doing a studio visit someone that's like hanging out with them someone who sort of um, knows the work from the work and the artist um, from sort of the studio but also from um, socially and so it was just it was a it was a sort of a unique vantage point that I also, I, I take what sort of every day, you know, I think that like um, when you come to sort of write about an artist or uh, curate their work into a show, you want to also know, you know, how they're operating in the world outside the studio. I think that's just like such an important, um, I think that's a, such an important 
aspect to know because often those that those ways in which you're moving through the world outside the studio it shows up in the studio practice right and so knowing sort of the links and knowing sort of um the sort of social um sort of context in which they come from or which they're kind of existing um personally but also you know culturally um is important and so that was has always been sort of from the sort of beginning has been about sort of not only you know talking about the Michelin's and Carrie you know Cambridge James Marshall and sort of those artists right um who are great and phenomenal and who I also have you know engagements with ongoing dialogues with but it's also is something about writing about and curating exhibitions around this generation right like what does artistic production look like for millennials right black millennials right um, right. That was one of the questions that were was just super important to me, you know, because yeah. I think that even if you think about sort of more, uh, let's say, institutional sort of black curators, um, you know, I would like to see them take more sort of chances with artists of our generation. I would like to them to, you know, I think there is one thing to sort of look at the past and that's great, but I also think that like there are a lot of artists who deserve solo exhibitions at, you know, the the museums. Whoops, you froze. No, I just think that that like that is also a very important sort of thing. Like, yes, like engaging sort of the history, but also taking chances, right? On right. um on on their own generation. Well, so I try to live that is what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna make a comment about that because uh and then I'm gonna segue into something else, but because you and I both know that the curators are very much involved with this structural system that is um, run uh, by people that uh, uh, stifled and neglected to, didn't want to have exhibitions by people that were not of European descent. Right. Um, so very candidly, they were not interested in showing uh, exhibition by black artists. So you have within that structural cultural institution, you have bias and right. you, have, you have just playing out racism and you have people at the top that are not willing to take chances, Antoine. And then within that structure, you have people within the boards that are not willing to stand up and take a chance. Mm -hmm. So those curators can then come forth mm -hmm. and do with their bosses right, right. Um, so that they can have those shows. So there's some layers in there that need to be peeled away. And the people, the, uh, people at the top need to be held accountable. And once we do that, I believe, in my humble opinion, um, that the, we will start to see the curators busted out. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. That it is sort of a structural change, right? But every the thing about institutions and that we should always remember is that every level there is a role to be there is a role to play, right? So it's yeah. not just the people at the top, right? Everybody have. A role to play. People outside the institutions who are pushing those institutions, people are at every role, you know, even the curators that we talked about, you know, um, have a role to play, right? Um, because very often, you know, we are often in service of these institutions, but not of the, not in service of the people who work at those institutions, right? And so I think that like accountability means not just board members and directors, but also um, curators, right? Because I, I think that like there are, you know, like, you know, young white artists are getting exhibit, are getting museum shows, right? And so like, it's not like it's not impossible. And so, you know, I, I, I just, I, you know, we're in this moment where we're looking deeply at the, you know, at the past and those who have been overlooked. And that's great, you know, and I think that, you know, Carrie absolutely should have had a show. I think that we, you know, we wanted to revolution, you know, I think that's an absolutely necessary show. Um, I think that, you know, you know, one's, you know, the Kamange show that's coming up, the Whitney, absolutely necessary. But I also think that um, we need to broaden the scope around what young Black artists are doing, not just in America, but globally. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. And this is a, um, that leads me to, to, to you know, the uh, frame, lead the conversations is, you know, it's framed by Black Lives Matters and civil unrest and George Floyd and, uh, the COVID pandemic, the lack of leadership in the White House. Mm -hmm. You as a writer, curator, how do you see um, art commenting, focusing on the current moment? 
Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I was listening to Kerry James Marshall talk yesterday about his new paintings, um, Black and Part Black, those, that new series of bird paintings um, they did. And, you know, the, the moderator of that conversation um, with Kerry, um, one of the gallerists, white gallerists at David Sorner, um, said, considering where we are, right? And then Kerry just goes, you know, um, we've always been here, you know? And, and so it's that sort of, that, that, that subtle sort of like pushback in that moment. It was, it was lovely, you know, Carrie has this like kind of grandfatherly voice, you know, like it was sort of subtle in that moment, but it was, it was a real necessary, I think, shift in the way that we need to look at this moment, right? right. And yeah. I think that like, that for some people, you know, this is, this is, you know, this has, this has happened forever, right? We've, we've always been in a situation of, um, of, you know, uh, let's say manageable death, right? And mm -hmm. so we've been in a situation where um, we are, you know, dying, you know, in all these different ways, right? And a lot of people are, and I don't even mean just sort of when you get to the sort of the most sort of um, flagrant of the violence, right? An officer putting his, na his, his knee on someone's neck for eight, eight minutes and 46 okay. seconds. But I'm also talking about what we're talking about, which is, is, is the way that people died social deaths, right? Um, yes. Through lack of representation, through lack of sort of having their ideas, you know, dealt with in a way that is equitable and that, um, you know, uh, treats sort of their intellectual contributions. Um, say to art um, in ways that um, are challenging and in ways that are empathetic and in ways that, you know, really sort of allow us to just move beyond sort of the one kind of conversation we're having around, say, representation and start to kind of focus on some of the more formal stuff and start to focus on, you know, other sort of relationships that that art has to the, to the world, you know? Um, I One of the things that, you know, that, I keep coming back to, you know, um, now is just how generous artists are always with their work, or, yeah. or not always, but generally with their work, and mm -hmm. that there are so many different ways in which that we can kind of go into the work, right? And so like questions, so, so, so the, the sort of conversations that we foreground, and mm -hmm. the sort of narratives that we foreground, those are choices, right? And I think that like in this moment, we're very sort of, oh, we're, we're very uh, good at having conversations about why representation matters or what, or conversations around black death or, you know, things like that. And, and using those images to, you know, um, you know, rather effectively. But there are also other conversations that we need to have um, to really get at sort of a fuller expression of uh, not only, you know, Black artistic production, but just like Black humanity. Well, that brings me up to your tweet, Antoine. Oh my God, my tweets, my tweets, <laughs> my tweets. <laughs> so Rachel, can you pull up the tweet about the current aff affirmative action coverage of, of Black so artists by virtually I all white at pubs that absolutely refuse to hire Black critics is something else? The most glaring aspect of it is that none, that none of them have owned up to the active roles they play in an ongoing erasure. And then you go on to say the art world is only the only place a non-black. Oh, here you go. I'm sorry. The other half measure, the white editor who commissions the black writer or photographer they happen to like to make work about the violence happening to those artists and their communities, but not staffing them. And then uh, finally, you say that the art world is the only place a non-Black POC writer can make an entire career out of writing about Black art and artists like they have some kind of intimate inside the circle. I'm sorry, authority. Um, Antoine, sometimes you're so funny, but you're right on point. Sorry, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I mean, the tweets, the tweets, you know, it's Twitter, you got to get them off. Like, but I mean, that... These tweets, I mean, I just, I mean, some of these publications, and not even to be funny, these publications, it's, it's almost like if you read them today, it's like you're reading Ebony or Jet, like in, you know, the middle of the 1970s or something. You know, like there's this sort of like, like overcorrection happening um, that 
is just so, in my opinion, disingenuous. Um, and I'm not gonna kind of, I'm not gonna sort of try to single out one, but I'm just gonna, I'm speaking sort of to the, cause it's a general sort of landscape issue, right? Um, mm -hmm. There are no, you know, black you know, critics on staff that are covering visual art anywhere, you know? Where's anywhere? that? Anywhere? I mean, it, like anywhere. where? I don't know. I thought you were working for the New York Times. I mean, I, I write for places on occasion, but I'm not on staff at these places. And it's also, I, I also want to say, because I was really hesitant about tweeting this stuff, because I'm not looking for a job. I have many. Like, that's not what's happening here, right? You're speaking <laughs> your truth. You're speaking your truth. Yeah, exactly. And so, I'm not, so this is not a way for me to sort of like try to get a job. You know, it's like I'm certainly great in that department. It, but it really is, it is about sort of the ways in which like, we still in these, you know, sort of in these moments that are supposed to be on us, we still, um, we still are sort of perpetuating inequalities, right? And I'm not, but it, it would might be a start to have a few different sort of, you know, black people sort of bringing their experience, right? Um, and it and it's also it's just very sort of telling that that. At, play, at different places that they are willing to say on occasion commission, you know, a black writer, but not sort of give them sort of those resources to be there for 30 years, to develop their voice, to develop, you know, their eye, to, de you know what I mean? I'm talking, I'm saying that if we're talking about systemic change, that's a change, right? From kind of business as usual. And I also, it's just also funny. It's like, it's like the same people, if we can all agree that that black artists had not gotten the sort of critical coverage that they should have gotten for say the last 40 or 50 years, you know, if not across the last right? Yeah. We can all agree to that, right? There are people who have been at these publications, art critics, at these publications for the last 30, 40 years. Decades. Do the is it I'm so so do they now get to also write about the artists that they willfully ignored? and not sort of apologize, not sort of kind of talk about why they did that? Is there no sort of, in, you know, integrity to, to the process, right? And so that's, so my point is like, like you can look, you can open New York Times, you can see Carrie, you can see all these people who should have gotten all these things, but the whole conversation that's happening, say in any of these publications is around black pain, right? Absolutely, and, and black it's not, and it's not, it's not say, it's not, say, a, a review of a show, right? Which is a different thing, right? right. And, so I, and, and I, so I think about, I think about sort of the, the, that story or the stories over the last few years, right? That um, talked about black galleries and black gallerists and, you know, and how there's one story being told in all of those sort of, um, those, those uh, articles. Yeah. Right. Are, and, and, it, and it's that there is some sort of lack Right, but those, but and those, and, and that's the same. But do they come and review the shows? Do they look at your gallery program? Do they, you know, like like all the things that they do for other gallerists? Do they are they present in those moments? And the question, the answer is clearly no, because it's because they're very comfortable with saying black gallerists are pigeonholed. Not not saying that it's not true, but also there are other aspects to that story. And by the way. Um, magazines and newspapers, they also, that, they also play a role in the pigeonholing of these galleries or these artists, right? Or these writers. And so I think that like this, this sort of like objective stance that these places take um, are disingenuous because, um, you know, it shouldn't take, again, a George Floyd um, to lose his life for, you know, places, publications, to change their coverage, you know? Like, what does it say about sort of the value um, of, you know, um, Black life? But also, what does it say about like the motives of those publications, you know? Yes. So, so for me, a lot of it is, there's a lot of virtue signaling happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of sort of using um, these artists to make these publications look like they are in fact, on the right side of history, when in fact they have not been for a very long time, and so and so, so it makes it difficult to 
So it, so it makes it difficult to sort of, from my perspective, it makes it difficult to sort of get up every day and then sort of write for a publication like that, right? And so that's where like the books come in, that's where the curating come in, that's where, you know, like, like we need sort of different ways to, and I mean, I also think that, that like, you know, this is sort of a theory, but I also think that like, while you have a lot of sort of writers, black writers, intellectuals end up in academia, right? Because there, there have been more, um, not, not, much more, but there's been a, there's been some more space for them in that in that particular sort of world than there has been in popular magazines and you know newspapers um, and literary uh, journals. Well, well, that that's correct. Sorry, and that was my rant. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. We're here. We're here having a conversation. Like I said, pretend like you're in the project space at in Brooklyn, and you know, black owned. Um, we're we're not. We're we're just letting it all hang out. But what I, what I do um, want to say about not hiring black writers mm -hmm. is that sometimes, at least when I'm being interviewed by the white writers, it's like I'm breaking it down for them. And, mm -hmm. and in the end, sometimes they don't get it or they skirt to what they understand right. and write about that right. and not write about the more challenging issues. Right. So the, and, that's, my, that's my point in... That's my whole point when it's like, you're again, centering whiteness in a space, in an article that, or in a, you know, written text that is not about that. And so, and, and that's why I was, that's, that's my whole point is that like, because you, because where it's telling, where it's really telling, you'll read these articles and then you'll see our historical reference. And you would, and, and you won't see sort of the immediate history that these artists are, are driving on, you know, drawing on. You'll see sort of a a, <laughs> a reference to, you know, a, a sort of a white popular um, art history, right? And that sort of again, that use of history in that way reorients the work to be either, you know, derivative yeah. or um, again in the lineage of this one, you know, this artist. Not saying that, that that sort of expansive view isn't sometimes of value, but when art it, when you know when you're talking about a particular co context in which work is being created, which is very important to sort of in, um, review or whatever, you have to make sure that the that the ways in which the, those artists are engaging come through in that writing, you know? Um, that's why I like to always like whenever I um, whenever I write, even if I'm writing reviews where I don't even use quotes, I like to interview everybody. Yeah. Just so that I just you know what I mean? Just like I, I think there's a generosity in, 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 in that sort of dialogue, in that sort of um, talking to gallerists and artists and cultural producers um, who have a stake in, you know, um, oftentimes when I oftentimes um, I'll, I'll call curators that I know mm -hmm. and have conversations with them, you know, a period of time that they might know more about, or if they, you know, or if they curated a show about that period of time, I want to know their insights, right? Like, I think there's this thing, um, in writing where, like, it's such a sort of, yes, you sit down and you are the one writing, but I think there, there is a possibility for collaboration. I think there's a possibility for sort of making sure that the integrity of the subject, whether it's criticism or a profile or, you know, um, a, a sort of reported through story, that that integrity remains um, no matter what you say. You can love or hate the work. I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about the basic sort of facts and cultural sort of context that matters with, you know, um, when we're discussing art. Yeah, and, and that's part of the reason why, Antoine, I love it when, when, when you get, you're out there writing about emerging artists and other artists, because I go to your articles. If there's something I want to know about an artist, I look and see, has Antoine written about this? <laughs> I, I do. First thing I say to my staff, I say, did Antoine write about this? Because these other writers are going to have to go and, and, and look at their point of view that they're really looking at the work and right. are they really looking at it uh, through the correct lens. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I hope that uh, this time allows writers to have the confidence mm -hmm. to go and knock on the doors of those 
publications and, and um, online periodicals and ask them and demand uh, and continue to knock, knock, knock until you get in because you're going to be turned down and until you keep going and going and going, they're, gonna, they're not going to pay attention to you. So I mean, that's, I, I mean, I've also just, again, like I'm working, I'm always, I just like, there's so many projects I'm sort of in between. And so people right. can tell me and say, I, you know, like, can, would you write about this? And then now I'm just like sending all, all I was, <laughs> it's really funny. I was in Thelma's office doing, uh, for the, this book, this um, Young Gift and Black book. She did a conversation with uh, Bernard Lumpkin and I, I, uh, I sort of moderated the conversation and edited the text. And it was really sort of, we were talking about the role of black um, collectors. And, you know, we're talking and I go, and I asked a question about sort of the collectors that came before this moment, right? Mm -hmm. And she just had a list of, you know, like that, of people that, you know, over the years, she had a list of curators, she had, you know, and it was just, it was so inspiring to sort of like, see her kind of think that way and then and, and also for me to sort of develop a list of young writers who I read you know um that I think should also be contributing to on um, the conversation so very often I'll send names back and say thank you you know whatever but you know you should reach out to these people and do they reach out to those people yeah sometimes you know okay I think that's great I I also want to just expand a little bit more yeah, about yeah. Um, uh, another thing that's happening here is that institutions taking uh, black artists work in and in, in, uh, without their permission and quoting them. Uh, can we pull up uh, Glenn Ligon's? Um, oh, I loved, I loved, I, I loved Glenn's reaction to, to sort of that moment. And it wasn't, it wasn't just FS MoMA, right? It was the, it was, I think it was MoMA, it was the Met, it was the Tate. I think it was like, you know, it was a lot of institutions who um, found this moment um, as an opportunity that they wanted to show, you know, uh, the black artists in their collection, right? Um, despite maybe never actually putting that work on display or, never, you know, in, or not engaging that work um, actively um, through their curatorial processes, right? And so, th and so I'm glad that Glenn stood up and said that, you know, you're not going to tokenize me, you know? Um, the work could be about this moment, but it's also bigger than this moment, right? right. Um, and I, I think I just, I think more artists need to sort of take those sort of stances, you know? I think that even with writing too, like, like, if you have 15 white writers come to your studio and write about your art, I think that at some point you can say, maybe I want someone from inside the circle or someone from a different experience to sort of think about this work. Um, because honestly, it helps the work. It helps to sort of, um, the, the, it helps to expand sort of the possibilities of the meaning um, of the art, right? Because I think at the end of the day, when anyone's sort of researching anything, like why this is super important when anyone's researching anything, they go to the internet and they type in your name, you know, and they look at sort of what comes up, right? And so you want to make sure that um, that sort of digital sort of uh, memory of your work, you know, of the exhibition, right, um, that might have went up 10 years ago, but the writing remains, right? The writing always remains, right? Um, that that sort of record, that sort of archive um, is filled with, um, not just, you know, perspectives that, um, have long ignored you, you right. know? Well, let's, so, so part of, I think, um, it, it's sometimes uh, institutions avoiding this or maybe again, having a culture that, um, nurtures, um, uh, that, that nurtures in inclusive, uh, uh, and also, uh, people being on these boards that uh, um, in that question or, or have people ask these questions, is this the appropriate action we should be taking? Is there another way we can communicate our thoughts? But uh, it's also about like, like you keep talking about, or not keep, but like boards, you know, kind of is a theme. And, you know, one of the things is like, 
like if those boards are always going to just be like there needs to be different standards by which you know a board is formed mm -hmm. and it can't just be about your money you know okay. and it just can't it just can't be um about like you need intergenerational boards right you need like artists on those boards and not just sort of established, really accomplished artists, but you also need young artists on those boards. You also need, you know, educators on those boards. You also, you know what I mean? Like, like, like I think we think so narrowly about who deserves to have power in our institutions. And then, you know, we almost are shocked that our institutions are behaving this way, you know? Like, of course, you know, this was the institutional response because look who's running institution, you know? like. Like that's not, that's not a, um, like none of this, it's sad, but none of it's shocking, you know, that like, that, that museums will release a statement like that. And then I guess we'll have to, you know, say something about that because of the way those institutions are ran. Well, you know, I, I do want to go to another one of your tweets and, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, sorry, sorry that, these tweets are <laughs> no, well, you know, every day I have something to stop tweeting. There are records, you know, one of them is uh, talking about uh, uh, initially it was it was just before the Guggenheim said so the Guggenheim has no black uh, full time black curators. That well, they do. Ashley James is there. Yeah, they, do. Yeah. they do now. Mm -hmm. But prior yeah. to that, they didn't. Yeah. And yeah. so you were you were asking the question. But but one putting Ashley James on doesn't solve the um, it's still a big issue around the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, yes, no, one, I, I didn't mean to imply that one makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, um, what do you say here in your tweet, Antoine? You say... Um, a letter was signed. Signed, the curator department sent money. Uh, Rachel, no, the one with the... Um, uh, the one uh, with the curator for the, the Guggenheim exhibition. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, let me see. Let me pull it up on my phone. This, I so this is, yeah. I mean, this, honestly, I don't, like, know, like, I'm not backtracking, but I, I, this, the Guggenheim situation seems to be, like, there seems to be a lot of moving parts, and, like, the, this question of, like, of um, this particular curator, who did the Basquiat show, right? Yeah. That's, yes, yeah. yeah. Who did the Basquiat show there? And then the questions around sort of ownership and authorship and stuff like that um, are kind of like weird, like on, you know, like to me, just sort of calling like I see it. Like, um, I think there's this like uh, obsession with like being the first, oh, yes. you know? And I think that like, we all have to sort of move ourselves, you know, go you know, beyond that, you know, and, and all, but also this happens in magazines, right? Like the first black photographer to shoot Vogue, the first black photographer to shoot Vanity Fair, all of that stuff, you know, yeah. I'm like, I mean, at this point, I would like to know, like, who's the 276th photographer to shoot that, you know, like, or whatever, right? Or like, who's the, you know, like, I want it to sort of, to be so commonplace that like people are, you know, that this is no longer sort of shocking. But I also think that like, it, it goes to sort of our sort of, the way that we're even sort of educated, right? Like Black History Month is all just a collection of firsts, right? It's mm -hmm. all just sort of like this fetishization of the first black to do X, you know, whether it's good, bad or whatever, you know, like we don't really get into those discussions. It's just like this person achieved this thing. And then we sort of like, we, we kind of count that first as an as equality, right? And it's far from it. And so yeah. I think that like we need to sort of like keep on sort of, you know, pushing and, you know, and in that sort of trying to be first, I mean, the thing, what also is sort of kind of weird about the first thing is that like clearly there were other talented people throughout that history um, who might have not done that particular job, but yeah. helped you get there, right? Yeah. And so, like, you know, one of the things that, you know, Tyler Mitchell, who shot Vogue, always talks about is he talks about the sort of photographers that he's sort of indebted to, the lineage, right, that, you know, might have not gotten the opportunity he had, but had worked to a point that allowed, that eased the passage for him, right? 
And so, you know, I, I, I personally just hate those sort of first politics, just, um, just because also it, it feels like you're erasing other people, right? Like in the sort of, you know, I'm not saying don't be proud of your achievement, like, like, please do. But I feel like our generation now is just sort of like obsessed with like, this sort of like, you know, I'm the first and like the marketable sort of aspect of that and not sort of like really sitting with, um, or, you know, sort of existence, which is like, um, and also like just in sort of the Guggenheim situation, like there was a show that Oakley curated, you know, in 1996. And so like, he was a, he's black. He curated the Guggenheim. Like, was he not the, you know what I mean? So I think that you get into all of these sort of weird sort of like niche, like just, you know, further and further niche sort of things. Carrie Mae Weems curated a show, you know, when, you know, when that, when the Basquiat show was up as well, you know, do we discount Carrie Mae Weems' labor? Um, and so I, I think that like, there are, there are a lot of other sort of issues. Like I, I don't, but I also don't think that like the environment that, you know, that the curators, black curators entering in that museum and others um, are not difficult and are not, you know, racist. Like, I'm not saying that. I just think that like how we respond to that also matters, you know, and like, and how we sort of position ourselves in those kinds of conversations also matter, right? Because, um, you know, it's not like we can all, you know, like I do, you know, it's not like we're, we're not also at fault in these institutions, right? These are also the institutions that also raised us, also set the standards for us, you know? Like we do practice, it, we do in our own practices, um, sometimes unintendedly, you know, perpetuate inequalities in those systems, right? And I think that this is a time, you know, while we're all sort of, you know, at home, isolating, whatever, to kind of think about our practices, right? And think about how we're moving in those institutions um, and whether, you know, we should be trying to sort of break down the door or should we be trying to create our own thing or whether we should be trying to, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like there's not just one path. Right. And so I think that like, you know, um, we should be kind of looking at all of them, you know, like, I don't know if every star black curator needs to end up at the Whitney or the Met or whatever, you know, I think that like there, there should be possibilities for us to build more institutions beyond, you know, the, the few that we have, like the Student Museum and Underground Museum, you know? Well, well there are private um, museums coming on. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that, that said, there's a question in the, the, the uh, here, how do you suggest that black art writers establish authority so they're not overlooked or dismissed by established institutions? I mean, that's, I, I don't have a perfect answer for that. I mean, I think that like, one way to do that is just to keep writing and keep sort of being out there and keep, you know, like, I think one of the ways that I guess personally, like, you know, it's that, I didn't even think about it as authority, but like the one of the ways that I just made sure that my writing mattered was to treat it like it did, you know, and really sort of like, um, you know, it's like there has been, it's so funny because I look back on pitches I sent about, you know, certain artists early on to, you know, New York Times and all these magazines and stuff, and they rejected them, you know? And like, and I, I think about that in this moment constantly where like, you know, they're green lighting a lot of things that they would like, you know, five years ago, they wouldn't run, you know? And so right. I think that like, like, it's also about like, you know, establishing your own, you know, that it's just not like gate, like, you know, it's like, those are not the, again, those are not the only models to live by, you know? And I'm not saying that as someone who like frequently collaborates with places, you know, with, in, with big institutions and, and magazines and, and whatever, but I'm saying that like, you know, um, you know, it's like I, the best kind of analogy I, I have is the, like last week I was in the Apple store buying some headphones and mm -hmm. this kid who, um, I, my name was on, it, was on the thing. This kid was like, oh, I know that guy, you know, he's like, he was just like, oh, I want to take him. And he's like, starts talking about his photography practice. And, and I was, he's like, I needed to shoot my shot. Like, can we do a studio visit? And I was like, like there's no sort of like, I'm not getting anything from that, you know, like there, it, it, but it's, 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 for me, it's like an act of community, you know, like, like if you think that I have some sort of authority, you know, let me somehow share that, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sort of, I think we just need to all be sort of open 
to co sort of sharing that. I mean, that's not the perfect answer, but you know, just write and write and write and write and write. You know, like that is the best way to establish any sort of authority is to to do the work. And and what about mentors? Mentors. Um, you know, I think that like writing. like did I have mentors? Um in general, how how can these I mean write and write and write, but you can yeah. write, 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 but you My write. My purpose was text, you know, like I really, like I just read and read and read and like, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, I'm still sort of learning and growing, you know, I don't think that's an ending process. I think that like, um, like I didn't have a sort of, I didn't have anyone to sort of talk to. I didn't really have a model. Um, I, you know, I, there were, there were, there were instances, right, of mentorship in text, right? And so I was like, oh, I loved how so-and-so wrote about this art this artist in art form 25 years ago, you know? Or I love or I know it's possible because Hilton Owls wrote this thing on Kara Walker. Mm -hmm. Cause, you know, Margot Jefferson wrote this about Roy De Caraba. Oh, I know it's, you know what I mean? Like I, I think that like that for me had been that was sort of one of the more formal uh, formative experiences for me was to know that there was a canon and to know that 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 you could um be a part of it you know um if you were willing to sort of do the work and if you were willing to sort of fail and get back up and do it again you know like i like there's no and i don't mean to sort of sound romantic about it because there's a lot of the times it's fucking frustrating but like right. you know like to like do it is to have that sort of sense of, you know, of, of, of uh, failure and have that sense of, you know, um, I'm doing the best I can, I'm trying, this is a, you know, I always say that writing is a practice, you know, just like art, you know, and, and you don't, you know, just like you don't, just like every artist, you know, doesn't uh, show everything in their studio, or at least good ones don't, um, good writers also, you know, are hitting those drafts, you know, and, and thinking and really trying to, you know, think through. And sometimes, you know, shitty art and shitty writing gets through, but that's just a part of the process. Right, right. I'm, I'm, I'm um, going to fold in here some, some questions, mm -hmm. uh, Antoine. And one is from Tracy Reese, and she says, so much of this conversation is focused on living artists or recent history. But I'm curious to know your, your um, perspective on whether it's important for curators of color to operate throughout the large, long history of art. There's been so much interesting and valuable critique of museums and their founding um, premises, but I see few curators of color taking an art from previous centuries in new ways. Um, Denise Morrall would be an example, Velma Thomas at the Institute of Fine Arts, another, but I'm hard pressed to identify many others. Do you feel that this perspective is unimportant? No, I don't think it's unimportant, but I think that we're particularly talking about a contemporary art world, right? And so I think we're talking about contemporary objects. Um, I think um, what Denise Morell did um, in, I saw the show, I didn't, I unfortunately, I did not see it in Paris. It closed the day before I got there, but I saw, I saw it in, um, I saw it in New York at Columbia. And I, I think those are ongoing, important conversations, but Denise, you know, with her appointment at, uh, Morel with her appointment at uh, the Met, you know, she's a 19th and 20th century curator, right? Like that's a different, you know, conversation. Um, it's not particularly my interest personally, um, right. but I think those are those are definitely important conversations to be had. Period. Right. And uh, Roger uh, C. Tucker the third says the Astor Gates is creating physical, cultural destinations by reconstituting abandoned spaces in the black community in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We have existing institutions like historically black colleges, universities, and churches. We, we can lead um, important conversations and document our own cultural contributions. Why are we always knocking on their doors for entry as opposed to creating and reinventing, reconstituting our own, which is what you were saying. Yeah, I would say that, that, that there are, that, I mean, I think that like, there are many models to it, right? What, I'm from Chicago, like what the Astor's doing in Chicago on the South Side with Rebuild is one model, right? It, uh, by the way, not a perfect model, right? Um, mm -hmm. what, what Underground Museum is doing in, in, in Los Angeles, one model, right? right? By the way, not a perfect model. What Rick Lowe is doing in Houston, 
with Project Row Houses. That's a model, not a perfect model. Uh, the, the Whitney, the Met, MoMA, et cetera, is a model, clearly not perfect models, right? And so I think that like, that like you know, our studio museum, which I didn't you know, um, include a model, not a perfect model, you know? Like I think that, that we need to, yes, like we need to also be going into those spaces. But I also like, I personally push back on that idea that these are not our institutions. Like they are institutions, you know? Like it doesn't say white MoMA, you know, it's not white museum you know, of modern art, you know? Did you put a W in front of that M? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying, you know? And so my, so my, my, so the point is to sort of push back on that too. And, and, and some of this work has to be about making these institutions ours, you know, and has to be about, you know, making sure that, and so I think that's one, again, one type of work that needs to be done. Um, and by the way, not just by us, you know, like, I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's a, that should be an everybody effort. But I, I do think that like, we are um, lacking um, institutions and pipelines in our commu own communities um, that really sort of um, are important and necessary. Um, I think that like, there's no reason why we should just have you and Miriam in Chicago and a few others, you know, in terms of the gallery space, right? Um, but also like, you, you also, I think in that, you also have to sort of recognize that like, not everybody want the same things, right? Like right. not all black artists want to be represented by black galleries. Not all, you know what I mean? Like, like I think that there should be, you know, there is sort of uh, the reality of this of the situation, you know. And so I think that like we all need to, you know, there are different models, right? And I think that not everyone fits every person. Right, right, exactly. And you know, there's positives and you know pros and cons about having. Uh, being a black gallerist, being a white gallerist, and yep. some black ga black artists don't want to work. I mean, it goes back to like this question of the like integration, right? Like, 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 what did we give up in that, right? Like, and 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 I think that is part of some of what everyone's feeling is that like we did have our own institutions, right? Like, and we they did, you know, function um, fairly, you know, well, um, producing, you know. A black middle class producing all these sort of you know artists producing space for the showing of that work the preservation of that work you know mm -hmm. and so I, I think that like this conversation is uh, sort of bigger than just um, right. sort right. of that and uh, bigger than just sort of museums but also sort of includes sort of a broader sort of history right because if you think about sort of one of the famous sort of things is is in the south when they integrated schools Black teachers and black principals lost their jobs, you know. And so, like, like that, that was that was one of the consequences of what we thought would move society forward, right? Um, and so, I, I think that and white flight, white exactly. Flight. And then all right, exactly that. All there's there are some layers to that. And my point is that that we need to sort of, you know, it sounds romantic, like we need to build our own, you know. But like that, that isn't always, you know. Um, possible or always the best sort of way. Well, you know, we've got a couple of questions about institutions in the Q&A. So I'm going to ask those and I'm going to switch over to the new Black Vanguard. So, so oh. hang tight and just bear with me because I like people's questions. So uh, Philip Brookman asked, how do the major museums in the U.S. reconcile their systematic racism today? They are doing a very Oh wait, how or are they how, how do the major yeah, how do they reconcile their systematic racism today? I mean, I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't have an answer either. Okay. I like like I mean it, it, it we're all endeavoring together. I think they need to be open to sort of endeavoring, you know. Um, a lot of which are not. So like I mean, start with like wanting to address it, right? Like start with like trying to figure out what, you know, how do you address that question? Yeah. I'd like to, 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 let's talk a little bit about the new Black Vanguard, photography, to me, art and fashion. Mm -hmm. That's your first book. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I, I want to also congratulate you on being shortlisted for the award that was just announced a couple of days ago. Thank and you. I, I believe Zanelli Mahali won it. Uh, was it last year? Yeah, uh, Zanelli won it. Yeah. yeah. Yay, Zanelli. Um, so, you know, that's a groundbreaking book that uh, really, you know, the contemporary black fashion photography, um, uh, it's, it's, it makes inclusive and reflective of 
you know, the, the wider terms of people of, of our different skin colors or different body types or, um, you know, gender, class, um, and all that. And the, the ex expands the notion of um, beauty and agency. Um, and so, you know, just going through the book, which is fantastic, you see these 15 artists that you selected. It's fresh, it's hip, but each of them have their own perspective and view as to how they are photographing at this early 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so what, what, what um, prompted you to, to, to um, present this book at this time? Well, it's, you know, Aperture asked me to, um, Aperture, the director of Aperture, Chris, um, called me one day out of the blue and goes, we have a spot open in our printing, in our uh, fall 2019 um, um, offerings, and would you like to do a book? And I was like, sure. Um, and about artists from my generation talking about write about their contributions um for me the most exciting thing that was happening in photography was this thing that's happening that i call the new black vanguard but it's this sort of play by this generation of photographers between the sort of commercial and conceptual um and they're sort of rethinking a lot of our norms around desire around for what photography can do um, around the history of photography, around fashion, around presentation, um, around desire. Um, and so I wanted to sort of show that. I, I thought that like, and I also wanted to have a conversation that people weren't having, right? Very often what we do is we just write off this sort of, um, these sort of images, right? And we write them off, but also these are the images that we first come to know, you know? in our family photo albums, in, our, in the magazines we first look at. And so they have sort of an outsized impact on um, who we are and, yeah. um, the, and, and, and the notions that we kind of live with around, um, around again, beauty, desire, and being. And so I wanted to just kind of take a sort of international look. Yeah. And so I just started to do research on photographers working in this way. Um, and looked at, I mean, hundreds of, I mean, there were just so many of them, right? Um, and, you know, we included photographers with diverse practices from um, South Africa to Lagos, to London, to New York, Los Angeles, Dominican Republic. Um, and we, you know, we, we just wanted to make sure that um, there was sort of a expansive view um, on sort of what photographers were doing. And so um, that's how sort of the New Black Vanguard kind of comes, comes about. And we, you know, we, this is Tyler Mitchell's work in front of us here. Um, and it's, it, for me, it's, it really is the playing with the in-between, right? I think that like for so long, um, we just, you know, people just said, you know, we didn't have any great black, you know, fashion photographers right because they weren't in the cover of vogue right or they weren't on the cover of vogue or in the pages of vogue or whatever and I, you know and they operated primarily in sort of an art context and so for me the book is just about now but also about the history right james vanderzee um uh, right. bitta bay uh, james banar um you know anthony barboza um you know all of these other photographers who are working in you know 20th century um, Kwame Birdswhite, you know, um, who are working um, not and using sort of fashion um, as, as, a, as a way to stage a photograph, right? Um, and thinking about sort of, um, you know, representation um, as an act of making, right? And so, and, and, you know, which is different than sort of representation as sort of representation, right? Which is sort of what Douglas Kremp talks about in pictures and blah, blah, blah. Um, but, and so it just seemed like this was happening now and the photographers were young and, you know, we have, we have everyone from AWOL, Arisku, who, you know, is just like, you know, went to Cooper Union, went to Yale, thinking about this stuff to, um, self-taught photographers um, in, you know, Lagos. And, 
you know, like all and everyone in between, you know, um, to really sort of, you know, kind of think about a constellation of um, imagery um, that sort of adds to the history of Black portraiture, you know. It was also, it was also me thinking about bell hooks, you know, um, picturing and, 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 and um, Deb Willis Thomas with picturing us. And, you know, sort of Thelma Golden with, you know, um, that essay, My Brother from 1994, where she talks about sort of representation being key to sort of power, right? And, mm -hmm. and thinking about sort of those thinkers, right? And those curators who came before, who really laid the ground for this stuff, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a book about now, but it's also a book about before, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But it's also a book about how the internet has kind of changed our relationship to images, right? And how we are consuming so many images a day um, and across all of these mediums that it allows us to sort of make new meaning um, or bring new meaning to these images that we are just sort of discreetly disseminate, you know, kind of consuming um, and that are acting on us, right? right. Um, and so it, was so it was so interesting to sort of take some of these images out of context, right? Like the cover, um, is a Vogue uh, lipstick shoot. Okay. You know, and like you wouldn't, and so it also, it also sort of ties in what sort of, um, I know that, you know, um, you're, you know, a sort of very, you know, you collect um, Hank Willis Thomas very deeply. And it also, it is sort of, it, it also plays on what Hank was talking about conceptually when, you know, with the unbranded series, right? And, and sort of removing sort of that, that architecture of advertisement from an image, right? And what then does that image sort of become, right? What is the possibility of those images, right? Once right. you sort of, once, it, and, and, and that's now how images are circulating on Instagram right. and, Twitter and Tumblr and whatever. And, yeah. so I, and so I wanted to have that conversation and I wanted to make sure that we establish that by and large, leading that conversation were young right. black photographers. Yeah, I think it's I think it's so important. And um, the breadth uh, uh, of this, I mean, I, I just was flipping through the book again, and even the essays that you have with mm -hmm. the uh, younger generation, with the older generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Those could be right. Then those those conversations. So you have Mickling Thomas in conversation with Cool Lemons. You have Tyler Mitchell in conversation with Del Willis Thomas. You yeah. have. Um, you have Campbell Addy in conversation with Jamal Naxlana, and they're talking about sort of creating their own platforms to share their images, right? And so Jamal created um, Bubblegum Club in Johannesburg, and then Campbell created um, Knee um, Journal and Agency in London, right? And so, the, so, so it's not only about sort of dissemination, but it's also the control and construction of those images, right? And so you have these young photographers, you know, no one's over 35, I think, in the book. Um, the young ones being 22, sort of really sort of critically thinking about how, what images they want to create, what they want those images to sort of say to the world. And then not only that, how do they want those images to live in the world, right? Do they want them to live on a cover of a magazine, in an art gallery, or on the internet, right? And so it's a collapsing of space, right? And it's also sort of a turn from previous generations who were all about sort of trying to make it inside the institution, you know? And they were all about sort of the, the height was sort of a museum show or being on a cover of a magazine, whereas this generation in some ways have said, okay, those institutions are fucked. How do we create our own, you know? Or how do we sort of move outside of those institutions, right? Um, which also gives me just a great hope, right? That, that we all can kind of take something from that, the way in which they're moving throughout the world, where they are sort of at every state, you know, at every step, they're circumventing traditional gatekeepers, right? Right, which we all, we have to figure out how to do it. Exactly. We have to figure out how to do it. And um, that's going to be the key to actually, this is a groundbreaking book that I think everybody should have in their library. And you can get it through Aperture. And it's so important to, be, to hear these conversations because it's not filtered. It's through Antoine, his writer, Antoine conceived it. He's writing about it. There's, um, you know, very serious other writers. Deb Willis is one of the most uh, respected scholars <laughs> around and Micheline Thomas as well and other writers. So I highly suggest you get this uh, and, and put it in your library and keep it and show it friends and get them to get the book as well. It's, it's that important. It's one of these books that you're gonna look back two decades from now and it's out of print and wish you had it. 
So Thank you. that that I need to take I need to take we need to take that energy with me everywhere I go. <laughs> I need that energy. Well, I, need well, that energy. I, I, I also want to move into just real quickly into Dario. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Yeah. The, the 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 Vanity Fair. Um, Rachel, do we have the Vanity Fair cover? Uh, the Vanity Fair color cover that just came out. Um, uh, what what do you think about this? You know, I I have I just want to first by saying I have so much respect for Dario yes. um, as a creative, you know, who I know and respect and who is in the city creating really wonderful things. Um, I, you know, like on the face of it, right? Like it's a beautiful shot of Viola um, mm -hmm. Davis, um, one of the most celebrated, you know, um, artists um, in, you know, um, acting in film. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I didn't have, I, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was a great way to sort of honor what she's doing. Um, but the reference, right? The, um, the primary reference for the image was, the Gordon, you know, enslaved image with the scars on his back, right? And I just felt that that was sort of a irresponsible mapping um, of his pain onto her body um, in ways that I think, like, if you want to have that conversation, maybe the cover of a, obviously a cover of a magazine of a fashion magazine isn't sort of the place to have that conversation. I think there are limits personally. Um, and I, I really do think that like, there was a great deal of conversation, productive conversation around this cover, um, around how like, you know, we often recirculate images of Emmett Till, of, uh, you know, and others, right? Um, in this sort of spectacle, right? In this way where we, where, where the, where the circulation of, of black pain of black, you know, of 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 uh, of uh, disaster and things like that just becomes so uh, common that um, it enacts another type of violence onto the body, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and so I, I just I really do think that like you know we again we need to continuously think critically about images about our references because those things matter you know she you know it's also really kind of amazing that you know again back to these narratives right like the narrative is never you know like she's this most celebrated you know actress etc you know it's always like you know it's this it's there's this narrative around hardship with her her overcoming you know every and i'm not saying that i'm not taking away from her her you know her the, the kind of facts of her life, but also there are also other facts, right? That she's won an Oscar, she's won an Emmy, she's won, you know what I mean? That like, like, and so like, so I think that again, she deserves, and we all do, um, sort of a forward telling of our stories, you know? Um, and I think that like, you know, again, this is a beautiful image, but um, the reference was troubling for me personally. Well, it's, it's beautiful. I think it's fantastic for Dario to be the first black uh, uh, photographer to be on the cover of Vanity Fair. So I, I think that's fabulous. But the but you're right. We need to look beyond that, and that is what where wherein lies the uh, the, the issue there. And uh, we need to be careful that we don't let the mainstream. Um, uh, focus our work into uh, a narrative that they are creating and they're perpetuating. Exactly. So, exactly. so we have to be very, very cognizant of that. Uh, I see it when I'm interviewed by writers. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I try to explain things to them and then they come back with their own yeah. uh, take on that. And that is why it's so important that these, that these um, periodicals and publications have black writers because I'm sick and tired of explaining to y'all about our culture. You want to, um, you want our culture, but you really are not understanding it. And you need to speak and have conversations with us so you understand where we're coming from. Right. And don't take our culture and modify it into your playbook. So yeah. you want to, you want to uh, deal with us, then come and learn and have these conversations and let us say what we want to say and don't filter it out. So that I, is at a, a caveat, it's 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 not just it's not just 
any old black writer, you know, like you <laughs> want people who are, who are invested in doing that work because, you know, then you'll have, you know, places sort of, it also shows up in the editing, right? Because you'll have places where things like, you know, there was this, there's this time where, uh, I, what's his name? He created Blackish, uh, Boris, uh, what's his name? My God, you know, you know, we all know we we're talking about the guy who created Blackish. Um, he said something like, he was, he was, he was praising Glenn's work, right? And this, this 25 black, yeah, there you go, Kenya, Kenya Burris. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, Kenya, hey Kenya. Um, you were supposed to buy a piece for me. <laughs> <laughs> he never did. He was <laughs> me all the way live. Um, and he, he goes, he goes, you know, there's, there's not been any black abstract artist. And that, that sentence appeared in the New York Times. And I'm just like, like any, like, you know what I mean? Like, like where's the editor to sort of edit that yeah. statement? And that ran in, that was an art piece. That was an art, that, that ran in the art section of the Times. And I'm just like, where is the editor to sort of fact check that sort of erasure, you know? But come on, come on, just think of the sentence. I mean, for sure. I mean, I, I'm, I'm for sure. But I also like, like, if you cared, you would never allow that to kind of get through. Right. But the fact is that that's, you know what I mean? Or call them back and say, hey, you said this, because I often do this with people. Hey, you said this. I want to just make sure that you know X, Y, and Z. Are you, do you, would you like to expand on that? Would you like, you know what I mean? Like, like, how do you, cause I, I like, like you're not a, you're not a stenographer when you're a writer, you know? Like you are there to, you know what I mean? Like, like this is not, you're not sitting in a court just taking down what right. anybody says, you yeah. know? Or, or have the quote and then corrected in the text, you know? Right, yeah. And so yeah. I, I think that like, it's just like, we need to have, a real reckoning around what is being published, you know? My computer is dying. <laughs> yeah, yes, and, and we, I wanna thank you, Antoine, for having this conversation. It's very candid. I know we've gone over the hour. Uh, we've got quite a number of, of artists. We've got several, I mean, participants. We've got several questions, but I think I just wanna say to everybody that Antoine is gonna come back with us when we're gonna be speaking about Young, Gifted, and Black Mm -hmm. with yeah. Bernard and Carmine um, mm -hmm. this fall. So I just encourage you all to tune back in. And um, it's always a joy to speak with you, Antoine. It's you always you so much. fun to see you when I'm out and about traveling around the world. And Oh, yes, we do run into each other quite a bit, yeah, out there. And have a, have a meal from time to time. Yep. And I just encourage people to to you know, uh, DM Antoine if he if if they have some of these particular questions that they may want, or uh, yep. we'll, we'll get them to him via email. And but at any rate, we've I think we've we've done what we can today. We want to remember John Lewis uh, and his marching orders for us to be the best that we can and challenge and challenge, um, you know, nonviolently. And uh, uh, there's ways to challenge without me with with uh, so that we can affect change yeah, um yeah. so anyway antoine you have a, a good weekend and you too and okay cheers bye bye, bye.